welcome to our 2023 April lecture series and to our PDHP lecture. I hope you're all doing really well um, and having a wonderful term break so far. And so welcome. Um, like I said, I'd like to, you know, welcome you all from all of us here at 800. Um, and yeah, I hope you're all doing really well. Before I get started, I'd like to um, just quickly talk about, you know, um, what we do here at ATA Notes and our mission to sort of help you achieve the very best that you can. Um, we've got lots of free resources available um, for you today and you can access them through our ATA Notes websites and these resources include our study notes so there are lots of study notes um, published on there you know by other year 12s and our previous year 12s um, and they're, in, they're really helpful in you know, consolidating your knowledge and um, and yeah, like combining your notes and sort of using them to further help you. We also have our lectures on this week. So please, um, yeah, participate in uh, all that are relevant to you and make the most of them. We also have discussion forums, videos, newsletters, um, our ADA calculator, which will be helpful down the track, um, and also articles and lots more on our website. Um, before I proceed, I would like to let you know that the lecture is recorded so you'll be able to um, review the lecture recording um, on this portal on which you're viewing the live stream right now also um, you'll find the slides that I'm using today um, on the portal too so definitely if you want to sort of be you know flicking along um, the slides with me pull them up um, but yeah I'll be talking a lot today as well um on top of on uh, yeah on top of what is already mentioned in the slides so that's that um and along with our free resources we also have some more resources um you know if you're looking for more paid resources to help you further um enhance your studies we have tutsmart which is our online tutoring and i am a tutor here at tutsmart i tutor english advanced pdhpe and biology um we also have our study guides a printed study guides to sort of help you achieve the sorry i'm just closing my window the best that you can and finally and unlimited is our online netflix for all our study guides um and one of the best resources honestly um and actually someone who has used these uh, these resources a lot um, and really benefited benefited from them i um i speak very very frankly um they're awesome awesome resources and if you are looking for that extra help definitely check them out so let's get um and before we get started today i also want to extend a special thank you to our sponsors um for their help in organizing these lectures so let's get started today um and let's go through a lot of fun stuff um i hope that you know today's lecture will help you reinforce some of the content that you've gone through at school and also help you um yeah you know gain a head start um in case you haven't done core two or if you're doing sports medicine as an elective so before we go ahead um let me introduce myself so my name is aditi and i um am a graduate from 2021 and I graduated as ducks with an ATAR of 95 um, and I and my subjects included English advanced extension biology PDHPE and also um, I did chemistry and maths three unit so I'm currently in my second year of bachelor of science and bachelor of advanced studies um, medical science at the University of Sydney as a Delial scholar majoring in medical science and political economy um, Personally, I'm a huge Potterhead, love reading, especially the classics. So that's like my, um, that contributes to my love for English in general. Um, if you have any questions about, um, obviously, firstly, anything that we cover today, please send them through. And also, if you have any questions about, for example, university or courses um, or, you know, subject and stuff, definitely feel free to send those through as well. So um, our game plan for today, we do have plenty to go through and we will basically be starting off by revising core two factors affecting performance we'll then move on to um 
gaining a head start on the key ideas from sports medicine and finish off with some HSE hacks to help you um, and you know to help you prepare for the HSE um, and really we'll focus a lot on like short on short answer questions and um, you know techniques in the exam room so that's my goal for today a lot to get through so let's get straight into it now Core 2, um, you know, is definitely, um, you'll see that it's very different for Core 1. So Core 1 is um, Health in Australia. Core 2 is Factors Affecting Performance. This is more sports focused. Um, and if, you know, if you are like a huge sports player and you love sports, you'll find this very, um, like, well, not easy, but you'll definitely find it, like, it applies a lot, you know, to a lot of what you would have experienced as um, someone who's played sports. And even if you've just seen, if you love watching, sports again it works for you if you don't like watching or playing sports um there's definitely a lot of theory that always you know is very nice as well so it caters for everyone now let's focus on the sort of the main ideas of what nessa wants us to focus on this is a compulsory module right so if you you would know already by now you are studying four topics this year in PDHPE, two are the core topics, so core one, health in Australia, and core two, factors affecting performance, and then you will be studying two electives that are chosen by your school, um, and one of the electives that we're going through today is sports medicine, because it is a very popular topic, usually everyone is doing it, like that's the usual trend, that most schools do sports med, um, so that's why, you know, we're choosing to gain a head start on it, because majority of us are probably doing sports med as a first or second um, elective, so, and if you're not, if you've got questions about another elective, that is okay too, feel free to ask those as well, so what Nessa is asking us to do um, is, in this compulsory module, we have to examine the factors that affect performance, in this module, students explore the physical and psychological basis of performance. They experience and critically analyze approaches to training and skill development and investigate the contributions of psychology, nutrition and recovery strategies to performance. So this just basically breaks down um, the way in which we will approach this. We'll, we are looking at both the physical, um, you know, obviously the physical aspects of sports performance, but also focusing on what goes on behind the scenes in terms of psychological preparation, nutrition um, and recovery strategies. So I have broken down um, revising core two into the four big like questions they want us to answer so we firstly got how does training affect performance we want to focus on um training types and how they affect performance we then want to also question how can psychology affect performance so now we're looking specifically at like psychological methods that um sports people are trying um in order to improve their performance on the day um how can nutrition and recovery strategies affect performance so this is more so focused on the prep leading up to the um you know leading leading up to the performance what are we what are sports uh, what are we actually consuming um and how are we preparing our body for the energy and um you know for the exertion that it needs and will go through on the day finally how does the acquisition of skill affect performance so this is now where we look at um the different stages of skill acquisition we will talk about how how um, different players are learning skills differently and how that sort of learning process is, um, you know, how the learning process evolves as a player evolves. So those are the four big questions that we are going through today and we're breaking it down um, according to how the syllabus wants us to approach them. So the first big question, how does training affect performance? We are looking at energy systems, we're looking at types of training and uh, types of training and training methods, principles of training and physiological adaptations in response to training. Um, something that I did forget to say at the beginning was um, today's lesson I will be in two things actually firstly um today's um lecture I will be taught like I said I talk a lot um you know like off the screen so like I don't follow read line by line what's written on the screen so I'll be adding a lot to that so if you want to jot down some notes just because that always helps with attention too like speaking from personal experience so um I'll be doing yes yeah, so doing that so jotting down notes um will be helpful also we're not going through the whole 
um, syllabus today, just obviously time constraints. Um, and also, like, you know, most of you have probably done it, so I'm going through the main um, dot points in each one. So, and I'll tell you which ones they are. So it's, that's why I think it's good to sort of note down with what I'm talking about, and obviously it's written on the slides too. Um, today, for this first dot point on how does training affect performance, I will be talking through the energy systems, what the three types of energy systems are. Um, I'll be talking about the types of training and also the physiological um, adaptation. So, uh, so the only thing that um, I'll skip over today is principles of training. So this bit, um, let me get that cursor, sorry. Uh, okay, laser pointer. So yeah, the only thing that I'll be sort of skipping over today is principles of training. Um, and I'll be focusing on energy systems. Ooh, let me see if I can tick it. Uh, yes, I'll be focusing on energy systems, types of training, and physiological adaptations in response to training. So those are the three main ones that I'll be talking about. Um, and then we go back to laser pointer and move through. So we've got um, basically the three energy systems. And the three energy systems are ATP, PC, our alactic acid system, that's anaerobic. We have a lactic acid system, which is also anaerobic. And then we've got an aerobic system. So with each of these, you want to know the process, the fuel source, the efficiency, um, duration, cause of fatigue, byproducts, recovery, and sports. Um, like examples of sports, they use these. So we'll go through them now. So with the ATP PC system, remember ATP, aden uh, adenosine triphosphate, breaks down into adenosine diphosphate. So it goes from three molecules of phosphate to two molecules of phosphate, and that releases energy. It uses creatine phosphate because the phosphate and creatine. Um, so it uses creatine phosphate to break down. Um, so it breaks down creatine phosphate to provide a phosphate molecule that turns the adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate. So as you can see here, so we've got ATP, breaks down ADP, and then we get that, um, then to go from ADP back to ATP, we need one extra phosphate, and we get that phosphate from the creatine phosphate, so we end up back with ATP. Um, the fuel source for this system, as you would have guessed by now, is creatine phosphate, because we are using that creatine phosphate to go from ADP to ATP, um, and the efficiency of ATP production. Supply is very limited, so it's not a very um, efficient source of production uh, of, um, of fuel. Only enough for one explosive movement and for a short period of time. So but now you can sort of guess the types of sports that will use this. Sports that are not very long that require explosive movement. Then we've got the lactic acid system. It is also anaerobic. So anaerobic means that it does not require oxygen to, um, you know, to break down the fuel. Uh, to, like the, it does not require oxygen to produce the energy. So with our lactic acid system, what the process that happens is glycolysis. So glycolysis is when glucose and glycogen, um, glycogen is glucose, like glycogen is glucose stored. Um, you say in your body, if you've got access if you've got access to glucose, it's stored and as glycogen. Sorry, that's a little bit of a biology um, tip right there. You don't have to know that, but just in case you want, you're wondering what glycogen is, it's basically glucose, but it's stored in the form of glycogen um, within the body. So glycolysis breaks down glucose and glycogen to synthesize ATP, which releases energy. So both of them, um, so with all of them, the energy is obviously coming from ATP. That's how our body, um, you know, that's how our, our, the, the energy in our body is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, but obviously the way in which it's produced in each of the systems is different. So the fuel source here is glucose in the blood and also glycogen, which is uh, stored in the body. Um, efficiency of the ATP production. So this requires large amounts of glucose actually to make ATP and it produces um, approximately three molecules of ATP from 180 gram of glycogen. So that, that is quite a bit, um, especially in, uh, so, and, and we'll compare that to aerobic just in one second. But yeah, that's quite a bit. And this would generally last, and we'll talk about this um, next, but this gen it, doesn't look, it doesn't last too long either. It is, again, very limited. 
finally we've got the aerobic system so the aerobic system um, as you would have guessed by now uses oxygen so oxygen allows for the production of ATP from um, chemical reactions that involve carbohydrates fats and proteins and basically so those are fuel source carbs fats and proteins um, and uh, yeah I'm just like making sure then skip ahead because you will talk about what what happens with those three in the next slide and now looking at the efficiency um, of energy production you can see that in the aerobic system we um it is the most efficient because it can produce three 38 molecules of atp from 180 grams of glycogen in comparison to the lactic acid system so you can clearly see um that this will be the most efficient system and this is further proven this is further proven by uh, firstly the duration right how long each system lasts so the a lactic acid um a lactic acid system all uh, the a lactic acid system only lasts 10 to 15 seconds at the most and that's if you go at 95 to 100 percent of your max effort it's not very long that is why it's used for um it's used for events that require um that you know that are like can be that that are short and require like an explosive movement um the duration of the lactic acid system is 30 to 60 seconds so that is at max effort so it can last up to a minute if you're going like 95 to 100 percent of your effort or if you're going at only like 75 to 80 percent of your effort it can last up to 30 uh three minutes and finally the aerobic system is virtually unlimited like it can last you for as long as you need until the fuel source is depleted um and yeah until the fuel source is depleted so the causes of fatigue are with atp pc system you get fatigued um once your pc or cp creatine phosphate has ran out once there's no more of it you start feeling fatigued in the lactic acid system uh, the lactic acid itself so uh you know if you and and the best example for this is if you're doing like a wall sit for three minutes and you start to feel that that tension in your quads that's lactic acid so so the fatigue here is due to the lactic acid building up in the muscles and in the aerobic system it's the glycogen glucose fats and proteins all being used up that causes fatigue you don't have any more um any more fuel to power you the byproduct of each one so for atp pc we've got heat sweat um with lactic acid it's lactic acid and finally with aerobic you've got carbon dioxide and h2o so the recovery time for each is different and you can see that that is due to like the fuel for each one so with a lactic acid system only two to five minutes because it doesn't take that long for your pc source to be replenished um so you know for pc to come and turn adp back into atp it doesn't take too long so like two to five minutes lactic acid usually like 20 um, minutes to two hours so again not very long but um yeah still more than the alactic acid system and finally the aerobic system takes uh one to two days so 24 to 48 hours in order for you to sort of restore your fuels um, and energy so the sports that use each one of this so with atp pc um an atp and it's called atp pc or the a lactic system you can call it either way um and pc can be also cp creatine phosphate phosphocreatine either way works so the sports that use um the a lactic acid system include weightlifting again one explosive movement uh high jump and also sprints so if you've got like the 100 meter sprint that's using the atp pc system like that's what 10 15 minutes not 15 minutes sorry that's 10 15 seconds locks that's using the atp and pc so the lactic acid system the sports they use that system are the 400 meter running for example 100 meter swimming and a kilometer cycling finally aerobic system it's those longer events that require you to have more energy that require more that you know obviously are going like going on for a longer amount of time as well and they include triathlons marathons and also 1500 swimming would go go on for a bit longer so the types of training so that's the energy systems now let's have a look at the types of training so 
there are four types of aerobic training now you need to know each one so there are four types of aerobic training that we're looking at and one type of anaerobic training that we are looking at um definitely note this down it can be always a bit hard to remember um to remember them as well so with the aerobic training so Firstly, we've got continuous aerobic. So continuous aerobic is when you've got no rest. It is sustained effort and it generally works to improve aerobic performance. Next, we've got fart leg. So fart leg is um, when you vary in speed and terrain. So energy systems co combine here because you are mixing, like you're going at varying speeds. So, you know, like super fast sprinting and then slow running so or, or jogging. <laughs> So the energy system combined with the aerobic is prominent because it is uh, it is like still continuous training. Um, and this can be very specific to the sport. So if you've got something like, let's say, soccer, you know, you're focusing on um, endurance, but also speed, like when you do need that speed to run very fast. Um, then we've got aerobic intervals. So continuous, no rest, sustained effort. Fart leg, we are changing up the speed and train. Um, aerobic interval is when we've got rest and recovery alternatively. So what that means is, um, you know, you do your exercise uh, or, or whatever the um, training is, you rest and then continue. But these intervals are short. However, you are going at your 100% VO2 max, which means that it's tapping more so into the anaerobic system. VO2 max refers to the maximum amount of oxygen a body, a, a person's body can absorb during exercise. So if you're going at 100% VO2, that means it is high, high intensity. Hence, um, aerobic interval is alternating sessions of rest and recovery. Finally, we've got circuit training so as the name suggests you're moving from one station to another and it improves both aerobic and anaerobic capacity so flexibility and coordination okay the anaerobic training so anaerobic training includes both the alactic and lactic acid system so with this what we've got happening is um basically you are both are anaerobic systems, a lactic and lactic acid. So you're sort of varying between that sort of time. So like, um, for example, firstly, it's for athletes that are non-endurance sports. You don't need endurance. You need that explosiveness. Um, high intensity and short duration. So you've got, you're going like 80 to 85% of maximum heart rate. That's, a, that's quite a lot. Um, the work rest ratio is one to three. So if you are working for five minutes, you've got 15 minutes rest. So that rest is um, obviously a lot more because of the, the energy that it's using. This is why it's for non-endurance sport. So you're going really hard and fast and then you stop for, you know, for like 15 minutes after going hard and fast for five minutes. Um, rest can include being stationary, just sort of sitting down, or it can also include like easier intensity exercises or stretching. Um, intervals performed in sets of repetitions. So they're designed to overload the anaerobic system. Remember with all of these um, exercises and training types, it, the purpose is to become better, to make your anaerobic or an uh, aerobic energy system better and enhance its performance. Hence why, you know, you they are designed to overload um, in order to improve and that's like you know we that's something that you talk about in the um, principles of training when we talk about how progressively overloading the system is important um a lactic acid into a lactic acid intervals include 10 seconds and lactic acid intervals can include up to two minutes to prove body's tolerance to lactic acid in the bloodstream so let's now have a look at the physiological adaptations so how is the body um you know adapting to all these exercises so, um so we start so starting off at resting heart rate so resting heart rate refers to the number of contractions that um the heart makes per minute at rest so that's you know when you're not doing anything when you're sitting down you're relaxing that's your resting heart rate so in an untrained person the resting heart rate is generally around 70 beats per minute in comparison to a trained individual whose resting heart rate would be like 40 to 50 beats per minute because they're more fit. Um, 
The stroke volume refers to the volume of blood which is pumped out of the left ventricle per minute. And this is because the training increases the strength of the heart muscles. You know, the more you train, the more you're overloading, you are increasing the strength of your heart muscles. And therefore, that increases the stroke volume. Finally, cardiac output. So cardiac output is your heart rate multiplied by your stroke volume. So uh, that gives us the total volume of blood, which is pumped by the heart per minute. So with this... Um, and you can see how that would mathematically work. So heart rate, it beats per minute. And um, stroke volume is volume of blood that's pumped out per, be uh, per beat. So we go per beat times per minute to give us the um, volume of blood which is pumped by the heart per minute. And at submaximum ex uh, at submaximal exercise levels, there is um, little difference between trained and untrained athletes. So it's, you know, when a trained athlete too is not like some maximals are not very trained like you know they may exercise regularly regularly for example however at a maximal level a trained athlete does have higher um cardiac output than an untrained athlete and again that would be because they're improving their stroke volume their resting heart rate is lower um so that's that okay so now let's have a look at um hemoglobin levels so hemoglobin is the protein in the blood that binds to oxygen and delivers oxygen around the body so hemoglobin level does increase um with training especially if you're doing altitude training so altitude training um it will increase obviously because you're at a higher um you know altitude than sea level and because of that you know you need to absorb more oxygen because oxygen is less in higher altitudes so that would mean that you're trying to get more oxygen delivered and athletes can maintain a higher average speed as a result of that the oxygen uptake refers to the amount of oxygen in the body uh, the oh, sorry the amount of oxygen refers to the oxygen the body absorbs in one minute. So generally, aerobic training increases your oxygen uptake, which means that there's more available for ATP production during the aerobic training. And oxygen uptake is also called VO2 max. So we looked at um, VO2 max when we talked earlier about... Um, when we talked earlier about aerobic interval and how because it predominantly challenges the and overloads the aerobic system it increases the vo2 max we've got lung capacity the size of your lungs does not change your lung capacity does not change with training there's no significant change with training um there may be a little bit it's no significant change finally muscle hypertrophy so muscle hypertrophy is when there is a growth in your muscle cells and mass but there's no change in length so the length of your muscle never changes um obviously until it's you know yet like yet yeah, the actual length of it doesn't change um uh, but there is growth in the muscle cells and um the mass of the muscle which makes obviously look bigger now, looking at the effect on fast and slow twitch fibers. So this um, refers to the amount. So flat, so fast, fast and slow twitch fibers. Um, basically, we've got both in the body. That's very important to sort of remember first. You've got both fast and slow twitch fibers. Fast twitch fibers are those that are generally attributed to like explosive movements. Um, so explosive movements like very high energy. In comparison to slow twitch fibers that are used that are more about endurance so the amount of each type of fiber depends on the function of the muscles that's very important too so for example um a, a part of the calf muscle has more slow twitch fibers because we need that endurance to for example stand up and walk around all day right so that's important there's a muscle in the calf um that has that like more amount of slow twitch muscle fibers in comparison to biceps that would have probably more um that have more fast twitch muscle fibers because you know you need that for example you know to push things away to like move things around to lift heavy things so you've got more fast twitch muscles um muscle fibers in your biceps so long distance runners may recruit uh, may recruit more slow twitch muscle fibers and sprinters can recruit more fast twitch muscle fibers that does change um so that does change with training as well 
So the the way we classify them are first we've got type 1. So type 1 are the slow twitch muscle fibers. So they're aerobic, they're red, they're they have large number of capillaries and lots of oxygen delivery. So and, and you can obviously you know see why that would be because it's about endurance. Um Oxygen needs to be uh, needs to be delivered so that the body can then uh, so that the muscle you know the cells can produce ATP. Um, type two A is when we've got fast and slow muscles. So they're anaerobic, white. They have some capillaries, um, more ATP and PC as well. Finally, we've got um, type two B. So those are fast so type uh, type 2 8 was fast and slow so we did have that mixture well type uh, type 2b is when you've got fast anaerobic white muscle uh, white muscle fibers fewer capillaries very few capillaries but more ATP and PC production so that brings us to the um, end of our first um, our first dot point, how does training affect performance? So looking now, looking through this, you should hopefully know the different types of training. Um, you should know the physiological adaptations that occur as a result of training. Um, and you should also know, let's go back, the energy systems. There we go, the energy systems that are used in each one. So let's move on now to how can psychology affect performance? Now we're focusing more on the psychological um, aspect. So we've got motivation. So firstly, the two types. So we've got positive and negative motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. There's also anxiety and arousal. So within anxiety and arousal, we're looking at trait and state anxiety, the source of stress and optimal arousal. Um, and we finally look at psychological strategies to enhance motivation and manage anxiety. So those are like concentration, uh, you know, mental uh, rehearsal, relaxation techniques and goal setting. So what I'd like you to, um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the right hand side so the right hand side column is asking us to look at firstly how can we use motivation to evaluate performance scenarios to determine the appropriate forms of mutation uh, sorry the mutations motivation also explain the difference between anxiety and arousal in terms of effects on performance and research case studies of athletes from different sports and ascertain the nature of their motivation and the psychological strategies they employ. So today we will just revise anxiety and arousal. We won't have a chance to go through motivation um, or psychological strategies. But what we will do is, um, but yeah, like what I'd like us to sort of think about is really with this, with motivation, we want to think about, okay, you know, if someone, for example, if an athlete is worried about their next game, if they're focusing on the next game because they're worried if they don't do well, they will lose their sponsors. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll lose their sponsors and also may not, uh, yeah, they'll lose their sponsors. So with a scenario like that, you can kind of tell that in terms of positive, negative, it's going to be negative. They're scared they're going to lose their, um, let me go back. They're, they're scared that they're going to lose their sponsors, right? And um, as a result of that, it's going to be negative. And then extrinsic versus intrinsic will the worry, this motivation to win, otherwise they'll lose their sponsors, is coming from not their wanting to win or their wanting to not disappoint themselves, but it's coming from a fear that someone else, like they, you know, they'll lose their sponsors. So that is extrinsic. So you kind of just need to sort of, you know, think about that. So basically positive is when the motivation is good, negative when it's not so good, when it's, um, when it's, you know, affecting, um, yeah, when it's not good, when the not good in the sense now, I'd like to say, um, when it's more so coming from a negative source to when it's, yeah, when it's basically when it's not good. Um, extrinsic versus intrinsic. Intrinsic is when it's coming from their own desires to succeed or, or their own fears versus extrinsic is when it's being affected by outside factors like sponsors and coaches and friends and family. That's extrinsic. 
Um, psychological strategy. So with these, these are quite um, self-explanatory, right? Concentration and skills. Concentration and skills. We've uh, there, right there. So we've got concentration and skills, right? Focusing. How athletes are able to focus before a game. Mental relaxation, visualization. So how athletes can, you know, visualize the, visualize themselves behaving a certain way like so sort of performing a certain way in the game and winning or you know getting a certain score or getting a certain goal um relaxation techniques pretty much the same in terms of you know for example um writing things down reading um taking a break doing yoga meditation and finally goal setting is when they have that goal in their head that they're trying to achieve so with all of them you just you base you want to have different sports um people and know some strategies uh different people that use these for example serena williams writes um a lot a lot in her diary um during or well before a game and every time that she comes down uh, you know to sit down and grab a drink that is when she looks through her diary and tells herself like um positive affirmations of what she's written in the diary that you know you can do this you'll win whatever so that's an example and there's so many more that you can look at okay moving on so yeah so let's now look at anxiety versus arousal so with anxiety and arousal, we are looking at firstly what is the difference between trait and state anxiety. Trait anxiety refers to um, is a characteristic of a person. It is um, you know it's when they display high levels of anxiety about an upcoming event. So they're always you know a bit anxious. It's a characteristic. So you can remember trait, um, for example, right there. You can remember trait with character characteristic. So. You sort of remember it that way um so that's related to the trait and characteristic of a person state anxiety on the other hand is situational so state and situation so anxiety that arises in a situation for example when someone's doing a penalty kick that is a high pressure moment so they're very you know, they're anxious in that moment but they're not you know anxious before the game or after the game or they may be anxious a bit before the game but not like you know after the game all the time um sources of stress can uh, be varied they can include upcoming events they can include training goals overcoming an injury rehabilitation overcoming new challenges or, you know consequences of failing so optimum arousal is a mental state uh, which is required for performance success so this is the kind of sort of state of mind that you want to be in to give yourself the best um, chance to succeed so there are different levels of arousal which are needed for different sports for example a low arousal would be optimal for fine motor skills so that is because in that like you don't want to be too aroused you don't want to be too excited too ready to go uh not too ready to go but like you, you can't be like too excited too jittery and nerve ner you know be like full of nerves when you're doing like a fine motor skill where you need to be in control and be calm um that's where you the optimum arousal is like really low in comparison to something like a uh, demanding sports like triathlon where you need stamina where you need to go full in you know that's where a high arousal is important so for high optimum arousal um there's use of pump up music caffeine sugar intense warm-up and also visualization for low optimum arousal uh, a lot uh, low optimum arousal you've got breathing meditation mental rehearsal relaxing music so this is demonstrated by the inverted U hypothesis, and he is the inverted U, the inverted U hypothesis. So as you can see here, we've got the performance on one hand, so we've got performance here, and we've got arousal over here. Now arousal, this is a high high end of arousal, um, and this is low arousal. For each of the three sports, we've got shooting, we've got grass hockey and we've got ufc you can see that the optimal arousal differs if you are in shooting if you're not like if you are um if your optimal arousal is too low here you won't perform as well but if you are like and if you're too aroused as well over there same thing performance is you know sacrificed but if you are just the right amount aroused you can see that the performance um 
is the best, like you can achieve the best performance over there. So that is what the inverter U hypothesis is, that, you know, you can't be too, um, you can't be, uh, like, they can't, you can't be um, too aroused or not aroused at all. Like, you need to have that optimum level of arousal in order to, um, you know, have a shot at the best performance. So for each of the sports, for shooting, it's very low. For shooting, it's very low in comparison to UFC, where you need to be very aroused, where you need to be very excited and pumped up to go. Okay, please excuse my um, annotations. I know they're not the best, but we're getting there. All right, now let's have a look at how can nutrition and recovery strategies affect performance. So now we are focusing more so on how do we actually go about um, how do we go about, you know, preparing for an event, preparing a body for an event by um, focusing on what we consume? Okay, so here we are. So we are going, so we've got basically, obviously our question is, how can nutrition and recovery strategies affect performance? So we are looking at nutritional considerations, supplementation and recovery strategies. Um, and we'll talk through all of them and, you know, with each one. Now, remember, your job is to do this bit. So I am talking about this for all of them. Your job is to have an opinion and you know be able to compare for example the dietary requirements um, of athletes in different sports critically analyze the evidence for and against supplementation and research recovery strategies to discern their main features so for each one you have to go ahead now um and be able to apply that knowledge so that's one of the big things with PHP is to remember what is obviously to remember the syllabus really well like you need to know the syllabus like for example if a question came about how can an athlete um you know how can an athlete's recovery strategies affect their performance you should know in your head what comes under recovery strategies you should be able to talk about physiological strategies neural strategies tissue damage strategies and psychological strategies that is why um really understanding and um remembering the bd syllabus is super important and and yeah because that's when you'll get questions like you know what recovery strategies are the best so a lot of your questions come from left hand side of the syllabus like sometimes taken straight out so it's just a matter of remembering and applying so let's have a look now what do we eat nutritional considerations so firstly we've got protein protein is used for muscle repair and growth Carbohydrates um, are a primary source of energy, and there are two types of carbohydrates. There are high GI carbohydrates and low GI carbohydrates. So high GI carbohydrates are um, generally uh, are referred to as uh, simple carbs. Uh, simple carbs. So these are carbohydrates that provide short-lasting energy relatively quickly, and they are good for when you need short bursts of energy. For example, uh, and examples of low, high GI um, carbs include lollies and fruit juice. Carbs they work straight away. In comparison to low GI carbohydrates, that provide long-lasting energy over a longer period of time. And they're really good for glycogen stores. And as you would know, we need glycogen stores, for example, in a lactic acid. Um, and I just quickly want to, now that I've talked about lactic acid system, I just quickly want to identify, or well, um, sort of iterate that all three energy systems are working together like your body doesn't go okay i'm just going to use the lactic acid system it's like you know you use one and then you seep into the next one then you seep into the next one so obviously we need like you know pccp any athlete who is a sprinter still will may have to use uh, still would have you know carbs that can, that can be used for um aerobic uh, and, uh aerobic is ex aerobic exercises for example sorry um so yeah so with low gi carbohydrates um remember complex carbs provide long uh, long lasting energy for a longer period of time they're good for glycogen stores and long lasting energy and these um and this is because they take they take longer time to sort of break down and that is why they can provide la um, energy for longer so examples include whole meat, uh, sorry, whole meal pasta, whole meal bread, brown rice, and quinoa. Um, and so that's for carbs. And finally, we've got fats. And fats are important for secondary energy, plus also for our vital omegas. So low here, um, just to flag, means slow. 
okay moving on so now let's have a look um now let's have a look at pre-performance nutritional considerations what should be yeah what should we be consuming prior to our performance so firstly pre-performance hydration is very important you want to be aiming to drink like two to three liters of water a day before um 500 ml uh, ml of water in the more uh, on the morning of the performance and finally 250 ml um, pre-performance so hydration is super important in terms uh, in terms of food eating complex carb meals is important because as we spoke about um carbohydrates they provide energy for longer you aim you want to aim to um you know you want to aim to eat carbs uh, a complex carb meal three to four hours prior to the competition so that um you know you can maintain and increase your glycogen storage because it is a main source of energy now carb and that is known as carbohydrate loading so carbohydrate loading um sorry okay so eating it three to four hours um before we start but obviously eating lots of carbs to store energy is known as carbs loading and we do this 36 to 72 hours prior so this is when um you know like two like um one two three days before so with complex carbs um as they release energy slower and they supply body with more energy for longer and they're also able to optimize glycogen stores to delay fatigue and thus maximize performance and improve performance by like two to three percent during performance um you want to replenish during um performance every uh Sorry, you're going to replenish during performance um, with 200 to 300 mils of water every 20 minutes of physical activity. So obviously you want to keep drinking water throughout the performance. Um, and food, it is important that the muscle glycogen and blood sugar levels are maintained. Um, and that will also help you avoid hitting the wall. So hitting the wall is when you're running out of your energy stores. So hitting the wall happens in the aerobic system when you transition from using carbohydrates as your main source of um, energy because the stores have depleted and you move on to fats and proteins. So when it comes to food, you want to refuel um, during performance, refuel with uh, both low GI carbs for later energy and high GI carbs for like immediate energy. So if you saw like, um, if you see uh, obviously like stuff like Tour de France, if you see um, cycling and marathon events in the Olympics, um, you would notice that they are consuming like water as they are cycling um, and also like cyclists eat as well as they're cycling and they eat things like bananas like you would have seen bananas um, and also like bread stuff I, I can't tell what it was you know from the TV but they eat like sandwiches not proper sandwiches like um, like bread rolls and stuff as well as they are um, cycling so post performance now this is when um, really important um to consider how we are going about um you know recovering the body from all the excursion uh sorry all the exertion so hydration is important because you need to replenish all the fluids that are lost via sweat rehydration is essential for recovery and it helps to repair muscles so to measure the amount needed we record the athlete's weight before the physical activity and after and we use that as a guide to, to sort of see how much fluid has been lost. So to replace, we drink, uh, so to replace that, I drink grams lost in milliliters. So for 500 grams that you lose while you are participating in an event, you want to drink 500 mils of water. So it's like um, grams equals mils in terms of water and um, water to drink and water that is lost. Food. So again you know with both carbs and proteins you need to replenish the stores so carbohydrates so to replace glycogen stores that have been depleted to hide you out for quick burst of energy um and faster recover for a faster energy recovery like lollies white bread and low gi like wholemeal pasta brown uh, brown bread to um help replenish glycogen stores for you know in the long term protein is consumed within 30 minutes window of finishing performance in which the body will digest and absorb protein to repair any tissue damage that is very important um particularly important for power strength and contact sports where you know the body tissue is frequently damaged so this is um it's more immediate you know 30 minutes after play 
Now, supplementation. Um, I will just give you a very quick summary on this. Um, so obviously know what the different types of vitamins and proteins and you know creatine supplements are being used for. But the left hand side is really important um, in the syllabus, and that is looking at um, that is asking us to critically analyze the evidence for and against supplementation for improved performance. And my 15 word answer is that supplementation is not needed if all your nutrients and you know nutrients are already being consumed in a healthy meal that is really important that is the answer here you don't need to have supplements if your meal is already catering to you know the right amount of vitamins and pro uh, and proteins and minerals this is because if you and this is where now you know you know because this question can easily come as like a six eight marker then you need to go ahead and tell me what those other you know you have to obviously tell me what for example protein does in the body what vitamin does what creatine supplement does but then you have to say that if all of these are already being catered to by a healthy meal you don't have to consume supplements because if you consume supplements what happens well the not like the natural uh, the natural levels of these um minerals in your bodies uh, in your body increases and too much of them can be harmful so like excess consumption of vitamin can lead to joint pain and headaches similarly if you're eating too much protein um you know you would have heard about less protein but like if you're eating too much protein that can be detrimental for your kidney function that can um that can lead to kidney failure too like too much protein as well so that is why you know that is when um questions like this you need to give me reason for uh, evidence for and against so evidence for you know could be that most of the time vitamins and minerals aren't catered for in the meals like not enough of them are catered for in the meals so you need to include supplementation for especially for example female athletes where they're losing a lot of like iron um through menstruation so for them like they need the supplement but if you already have uh, a good meal a healthy meal that is catering for the right amount of these um vitamins and minerals you don't need to overdo it so don't no supplementation if you are already consuming the right amount so now let's look at the recovery strategies and we'll look through each one, physiological, neural, and so on. So there are two types of physiological strategies that we need to go through. And you need to remember this, that you know, there are four types of recovery strategies. And um, in the first one, in physiological, there's two types. You need to remember that. So firstly, cool down. Cool down is done to return the body to its pre-workout straight uh, state. So, you know, you go, uh, so you do the same exercise, like warm up, but at low intensity. Um, and this decrease uh, this aims to decrease the heart rate and also it helps with waste removal like lactic acid and heat by muscle contractions during cool down which pushes um against blood vessels to aid blood direction and removes waste it also reduces doms which is delayed onset of muscle soreness um, and that can happen like if you don't um cool down after exercise the lactic acid remains um takes longer to disperse and that can lead to soreness the next day Hydration, again, is very important. So replenish as dehydration slows recovery process. Um, and hydration can help add, uh, provides more volume to blood to assist with base removal. Because, you know, for example, you'll be removing the lactic acid base that is in your bloodstream. And um, like we said earlier, grams equals milligrams so yeah grams equals milliliters so one kg is equal to one liter so if you if you've lost one kilo for example weight um before the event and after the event that means you've lost about one kilogram of water of fuel uh sorry of um yeah of, of water right so that means you should drink about one liter of water um in order to replenish that so i mean one liter of water lost not one kilogram of water whoops um all right then we've got neural strategies so neural strategies refer to hydrotherapy and massage so they're more about neurons and nerves related like the general nerves and body tissues so hydrotherapy assists um basically you're using water to assist recovery by aiding base removal soothe aching muscles and have um and has minimal joint impact so you can use cold water so ice baths or plunge pools which are 6 to 15 
degrees and you can use that for 3 to 15 minutes continuous or intervals so you can get out come back in or you can just sit there continuously there is also hot water hydrotherapy so hot water hydrotherapy is when um, you're going at like 38 degrees for 15 minutes um, and you can also alternate between cold and um, hot so you'd go like 6 to 15 degrees water for 16 minutes and then jump into um, a 38 degree spa for 15 minutes so you are changing it each time and the benefits are with cold water it decreases the blood flow so um, decreases inflammation and thus it also decreases soreness and it also numbs pain on the other hand hot water um, hydrotherapy increases blood flow it also increases circulation of oxygen and nutrients to damaged tissues and it decreases stiffness so you know if you've ever been sore you would generally you know, go take a bath a hot water bath and you'd feel a lot of um, a lot more relaxed and the benefits of both is both you know you're getting both um, Okay, so now let's have a look at massage. So massage with physiotherapist or foam roller at trigger points. And the benefits are that it increases blood flow, um, which, and which means that there is, um, so it increases blood flow so uh, t um, and therefore supplies oxygen and nutrients to fatigued muscles. It promotes waste removal, so removal of lactic acid. And finally, it also relaxes your nerves. Um, hence why, you know, both, both are part of the neural therapy. Next, we've got recovery strategies, so tissue damage. So this is chirotherapy, and chirotherapy um, is when you're using um, water and ice to help with damaged tissues by removing heat, decreasing blood circulation, and decreasing inflammation and pain. So I've got a YouTube video there for you. Um, it's in the slides if you want to have a look at how it actually works. But basically, there are three um, aspects uh, to the machine. So chirogenic uh, chamber this is where we are filling it up with liquid nitrogen so whole body three minutes it releases endomorphins which provide pain relief so you're actually going into the chamber of liquid uh, nitrogen um, whole body there is also local ice application so numbs pain and uh, reduces numbs and reduces pain decreases um, blood flow and swelling and finally cold water emergency same as hydrotherapy so there are three uh, different ways um, three different sort of elements of chirotherapy so you can go in a chirogenic chamber you can apply ice locally or you can um do cold water immersion and a way to remember this is to think chirotherapy uh cry so like cry chirotherapy um is tissue damage is equal to tears which equals to chirotherapy so that is nutrition and recovery strategies done let us now move on to the last big part of um, skill um, of core two, which is how does the acquisition of skill affect performance? Please, I'd like to remind you, if you've got any questions, please send them through and I'll be answering them um, as I go. So now let's think about basically um, how does the acquisition of a skill affect performance? So there are basically, um, there are lots of top points here that we are going through, but we'll have a look at the stages of skill acquisition. So we'll look at the, uh, you know, the, the three different methods, so cognitive, associative and learning, sorry, associative and autonomous. We will then look at the, um, and then there's the characteristics of the learner, for example, you know, how their personality contributes to it, the heredity, if they've got like, for example, you know, some people have, um, like, like, like hereditary, they may have, for example, more slow twitch fibers in comparison to fast twitch fibers. So how that may, um, predetermine them to like a sport or something. Confidence as well, the confidence in approaching the sport. Uh, prior experience, if they've got like, you know, prior experience in a similar sport, they can sort of transmit the, um, transfer that knowledge and finally ability as well so with that you should be able to describe how the characteristics of a learner can influence skill acquisition and performance of skills we've then got the learning environment so the learning environment is um you know we're looking at the nature of the skill itself so the skill um you know what kind of a skill it is we are looking at the performance elements what does a per 
an athlete or a sports person need to think. Um, we will we also look at the practice methods, so mass, distributed, whole and part, and finally feedback. What kind of feedback is most suited? So you should be able to do everything on the right hand side. So design a suitable plan for teaching beginners to acquire a skill. Finally, the assessment of skill and performance. So you need to look at the characteristics of the skilled performer, for example, kinesthetic sense, um, anticipation, consistency, and technique. So how are these things developed now that they are a more experienced um, athlete? Uh, the objective and subjective performance measures. So you want to know examples for this. So you know, like subjective criteria versus objective criteria, prescribed criteria, personal criteria. Um, validity and reliability of tests is something that we will discuss today. And personal versus prescribed criteria. So today we are basically going through say self skill acquisition. We are looking at the nature of a skill um, and practice methods because I think there's a fair bit to remember there. And finally, we're looking at assessment of skill acquisition. So we're looking at the characteristics and also the validity and reliability. So I've just marked them for you. So these are the um, things that we're looking at today. But again, if you've got questions about what any of the other mean that I've now that I've talked you through them, please feel free to send those questions through as well. Okay, so there are three stages of skill acquisition and they occur in the following order. Obviously, you start off with cognitive. Now, a cognitive learner is someone who is um, generally learning in a learning phase where they need a coach or a demonstrator to like walk them through what is happening. Um, the movements are, of course, slow and broken down into pieces so that they can pick up and sort of see what is happening. Um, many errors are, of course, made because it's their, you know, their sort of first sort of stage of learning a skill. Um, they need lots of feedback to correct their technique, but at the same time, you know, that feedback should be both positive and negative. Um, there is lots of thinking required to execute because, you know, the mechanical actions, for example, may still be very new to them. So they need to sort of think through um, everything a fair bit before they can go ahead. Um, I think the very beginning of practicing the skill, do you have this are you in the stage like at the very beginning maybe the first couple of lessons the first couple of weeks where you're sort of in the stage where you're still learning this um the skill finally you need encouragement by coaches by um yeah by coaches uh in order to you know progress to the next level and to still feel motivated to progress to the next level the associative learning stage is the practice phase where you are a bit more fluent you're making less errors um your mistakes are more self-recognized like you can fight like you find yourself making some mistakes and you try to fix them um and you start to develop what, what we call a kinesthetic sense a kinesthetic sense is when you're starting to gain that muscle memory and that feel um for a specific movement and you know you start to feel what's wrong versus what feels right for example if you're a bowler you know in your bowling you start to feel that you know for example your hand may be moving not in the way that you want it to when you sort of let go of the ball um or, or when you you know when you're doing a rotate when you're sort of bringing your arm around to sort of um deliver you know you may find that your hand's moving in a certain way or your wrist may not be twisting the way you want it to to i don't know like do you like a um, full toss or something? So you sort of start to feel what's wrong versus what's right. Um, and some tend to remain in the stage forever. And this could be because, you know, they may not continue on after that. Or they may not sort of, you know, play at the highest level. So they sort of remain in this associative stage. We then get to the autonomous stage of uh, skill acquisition. So the autonomous stage of skill acquisition is when our movements are more automatic, right? They're more fluent. An athlete is able to, you know, uh, in order to, uh, an athlete is able to execute a skill with very few errors, um, and they have sort of transitioned from that stage of being a learner to being an expert in that specific area, um, and they can also focus on other areas of the game. So now it's not just about like the technique, but it's also about anticipating what the opposition is going to do. It's also about um, calculating the tactics of the game. It is also easier to adapt to different environments. So you know, once for example, if you've got uh, um, for example a bowler in cricket and they are a skilled uh, you know they are sort of world class uh, they're at that obviously at the 
autonomous stage of skill acquisition they know what they're doing they will be able to sort of bowl um and you know maybe change their bowling technique depending on the type of pitch that they're playing on um or if you've got a batter um who is very experienced they will be able to adapt to the conditions um for example if the pitch is behaving in a certain way they may not you know they may just play defense or they may play attack depending on what's happening and that is um a quality of an autonomous learner who has rich uh, who has um you know reached that level where they're able to sort of discern um and adapt to different situations so the nature of a skill um, the nature of a skill basically refers to um, the elements of a skill. Oh, sorry, the elements of a skill. So if it's so, there are four classifications for it. Firstly, is a discrete, serial, or continuous. So if a so if a skill is discrete, that means it has a clear beginning and a clear end. And that, for example, shooting a ball in basketball, you know, you start, you hold it, you, uh, you know, you may be dribbling it, you hold it, you shoot it. That's a clear beginning and a clear end. Serial combines a number of discrete so that could be a layup in basketball. So we're doing like each thing individually, but it's a number of, you know, the discrete movements. Finally, continuous is a rapid skill. So that can include dribbling in basketball. It's, um, it's sorry, it's not a rapid, it's a repetitive skill. So continuously dribbling in basketball. So basket, so dribbling in basketball is a continuous skill in comparison to a layup, which is a serial skill. So those are the three categories there. Then we've got open versus closed. So open is when, uh, if a skill is open, that means it's always changing according to the environment, according to weather, according to the opponents. For example, a tennis serve. No tennis serve will be the same. It's going to be different. It's going to change, um, you know, with every serve. Closed, on the other hand, is when it's controlled and stable. For example, bowling in a 10-pin bowling, um, it's stable, it's controlled, the area remains the same, the, the, you know, there's nothing, nothing's going to come out of somewhere, the, the position of the, you know, the, yeah, the position of the, the balls is not going to change, so every time it's different. Um, so every time it's the same, it's not different. And then we've got gross versus fine skin. A gross skill is a skill that requires large muscle groups. For example, long jump. We're using a lot of um, the muscle groups to sort of power the movement. Um, in comparison to a fine skill, which is skills that are using isolated muscle groups. So think of your fine motor skills. Those are generally the ones that use, that, you know, are fine skills. And they can be easier to learn as well. For example, shooting. Obviously, you know, to get to a point where you can do it really well is a different thing. But, you know, it's something that still doesn't, that you'd probably be able to do um faster than like learning a layup in basketball so with something like this you know it's requiring isolated muscle groups same thing well kind of the same thing with like archery shooting um yeah and then finally we've got self-paced versus externally paced so self-paced um if a skill is self-paced that means the timing and speed are determined by the performer for example a tennis surf the performer the, uh, the athlete, you know, the tennis player decides where they're going to serve it, when they're going to serve it. Um, so it's self-paced. They, it, they're in control. Same thing with the bowler, you know, it's self-paced. They decide how they're going to run, when they're going to run, what position they're going to run up to. However, if a skill is externally paced, it means the time and the speed are determined by an external force. And that could just be, you know, like uh, someone, the player who's returning a serve, um, a returning serve in basketball, uh, the basketball in tennis, where the way in which they return and the position and the timing is all dependent on the initial serve. Um, a batter, right? So a batter, the way in which they hit the ball, where they hit the ball, when they hit it, um, is all going to be dependent on the bowler. So that is, you know, like contrasting examples. So now let's have a look at the different practice methods. So there are essentially um, four types here that we're looking at. So firstly, an entire training session. Um, so we're breaking down into the training session and the skill. So a training session can be massed, which means the lesson can be lengthy with very little breaks. Um, 
and that is beneficial for skills that are used frequently so you're continuously repeating the same thing with no breaks um or it can be distributed which means that there are shorter periods of practice with breaks and that can be important for um and you know that can be beneficial for learning complex skills that have a lot of movements involved and especially if you've got cognitive learners like if you just have a person who hasn't like who's not very good at dribbling never done it before not very good at it at all and you tell them to stand there and dribble for 30 minutes straight they are more than likely not going to be able to do it and after the time you know your concentration as a cognitive learner your concentration tends to uh, fall to two it is not easy to like for example dribble three balls right so it will um it will falter and so as a result generally mass practice is beneficial for learning a skill that is um more a skill that is used frequently that is repeated frequently and you would probably do this with like a with like an um associative learner in comparison to distributed which is generally more beneficial for um a skill that is complex and for a learner um who is in a cognitive stage of skill acquisition and then the skill can be part or whole so if a skill is part um and that means that the skill the serial skills are broken into parts discrete so you've got a serial skill uh as you can see here which combines a number of discrete um movements it's broken down into parts and it like individual discrete movements and those are practiced in isolation so for example shooting in uh so for example if you're learning a layup you're firstly practicing shooting and then practicing dip, uh, dribbling and then bringing the two together and doing it together so something like that would again work very nicely for a cognitive learner who's still trying to um who, who is still trying to sort of put everything together Finally, whole. So skill practice, um, whole, uh, when we practice skill whole, as the name suggests, we're practicing the entire thing. And it is generally used for associative and autonomous learners, not cognitive learners, because they are still learning the skill. They are still in that initial stage, but rather for associative and autonomous learners um, in order to start building a kinesthetic sense. If you're doing the same thing over and over again and you know how to do it, and you know, you may be, for example, yeah, doing it, um, maybe doing it in different like circumstances or conditions you start to build a kinesthetic sense it starts to feel more normal and um that again can include a basketball layup you do the whole thing and you're not breaking it down into shooting practice and dribbling practice so let's have a look at the characteristics so assessment of a skill looking at the characteristics so we firstly got kinesthetic sense so kinesthetic sense um if a player has a kinesthetic sense, firstly, they are generally um, an autonomous, like at, at the autonomous level of skill acquisition, because kinesthetic sense, even though it starts to develop at the associative stage, um, if you know you get to that stage, uh, you get to having kinesthetic sense um, as generally as an autonomous learner, and it refers to the proprioception of performance in. So this is when they, you know, they're in tune with their muscle movements. They can feel the error. They can feel, okay, this is not quite as right. This is um, better. And errors can be corrected as they're occurring. So if I'm, for example, I'm a bowler and I'm feeling, okay, you know, the way I've just held my ball in the run up and I'm holding it, I'm running, it doesn't feel right. So when I should deliver it, I need to not do it the same way. I don't need to, for example, move my wrist as I usually do. I'm going to... Um, not move as much i'm just going to focus more on uh the you know letting go of it um something like that where it's more you know you're making adjustments while the movement is occurring because you have a sense of what your body is doing so for example a surfer making small adjustment to their movements while surfing in accordance to the prevailing conditions um such in such as waves and wind anticipation so this is referring to the ability to read the play um as again as an autonomous player generally they're able to read the play they're able to read what is happening you know which which for example um which opponents they have to look out for um or what the technique of the opposing technique uh, of the opposing team may be and through that they can anticipate what may happen before it occurs and prepare for it and this is again a strong quality of an autonomous learner 
Um, so an example can include a skilled goalkeeper, for example, right? So we've all um, probably heard about the 20, uh, we've all heard about the World Cup, right? The 2022, yeah, 2022, right? Oh, I, I'm, I'm still sort of trying to figure out what year it is. Yeah, 2022, that's right. Um, World Cup. And so, you know, when we've got something like that, we've got a skilled goalkeeper who's able to anticipate in a penalty kick. Like, you would have watched the last um, penalty kick, France versus Argentina. Um, and just that, and you can see it in their faces where, you know, you've got the goalies who are able to sort of, who are, like, so focused on the, um, on the, on the, on the guy or the person who's kicking and as a result they're able to sort of see and you know see by the foot placement by the initial sort of um <clears throat> movement how they will and eye contact too how uh, where they'll um kick so this of course allows them more time to prepare and also think about how far to jump and die <clears throat> next we have assessments of skills so characteristics so this is when we are looking firstly at the technique so skilled athletes have good technique right otherwise they won't be skilled athletes um when they're executing a skill which of course will save them energy and allow them to focus on other aspects of the sport so for instance we've got an elite gymnast with correct technique um is better is able to better able uh, is better able to focus under pressure and execute routines seamlessly so they're able to deal with the pressure because they know that um um, you know they have they they have the right technique they have the kinesthetic sense for it so they'll they'll be fine um similarly we've got consistency so this is the repetition of good performers and so the repetition of good performance and execution so skilled performer is um consistently succeeding because they're able to replicate that um performance and technique every time so an example could be a skilled diver being able to execute a black uh, a backflip sequence correctly every time that they have a go at it so let's now have a look at the last big top for uh, the last top point for um, the stages of learning, which is validity and reliability of tests. So we are testing athletes, you know, they conduct they are uh, doing different tests. But when we do this, um, we need to consider the validity and reliability of tests because um, they're important in assessing performance um, as they use to check performance and track any improvements. So. We need to have tests that are valid, which means a valid test will test um, a valid test will measure or test what it is supposed to measure. So, or so for example, if you've got if you want to test a player's speed, you won't have them run a ten kilometer run because that is testing endurance. That is not testing their speed. But instead, you must you might time them doing a hundred meter sprint, which is more about speed and how fast they can really go. Similarly, reliability refers to the consistency of a test. So this is where we're controlling variables. So everything stays the same and each time you should be able to produce the same sort of test result. Um, yeah, each time produce the same test result. So for example, if you're doing a sit and reach test um, and you're doing it on the same box every time, um, you know, a similar result should be achieved. And if it is, then we know that the test is reliable. And I've got a um, schematic there for us to sort of visualize what is happening. If you, this first bit over here, you can see that this is unreliable. You're in, uh, that is unreliable and unvalid. It's unreliable because it's not testing what it's supposed to test. Um, wait, let me see if I can change the color. Okay, yes, I can. Give me one sec. Okay, so that you can actually see. So, it's this is where we've got, for example, if you can see that green dot, that if the um the dots were there, then you could see that that would be um that would be reliable. Uh that would be valid because it's supposed to sort of, you know, like get to the center. Um but it's not getting to the center and it's unreliable. It is unreliable because the results are scattered everywhere. That is why it's unreliable. However, in the second one, it is unreliable but valid because it is getting close to the center. Like it's, you know, it's not just at what it's not concentrated at one place, but it's 
getting around the um the board so we're getting close you know we've got some here um so it's getting close which means it's valid but it's not reliable because the results are not concentrated everywhere then we look at this one we can clearly tell that this is not valid because it's not anywhere supposed to what we're supposed to measure. You know, it's not a, in that vicinity. However, all the results are concentrated in one spot and that tells us that this is valid. Last but not the least, we've got a test that is both reliable and valid. I am getting my results close to where they need to be. They are hitting the spot every time and all my results are similar every time and that tells me that my test is both reliable and it is both valid this is something you would come across if you're doing like uh, biology too like validity and reliability are very important concepts in general okay so that brings us to the end of core two now I know I spoke a lot so please send through your questions um, and like I said I'll be going through the questions um, as well uh, and hopefully yeah answering everyone's questions if you've got questions specifically about anything that I've missed um, please feel free to send those through too but yeah the main aim for quarter today was to revise and to make sure that we are all feeling very um comfortable with the topics like i tried yeah i i've gone through like i've talked you through all the other doc points um and then focused in depth on the ones that i think are more important now let us have a go at um getting a head start in the sports medicine elective so there are four main questions that we are looking at in sports medicine so firstly how are sports injuries classified and managed? Secondly, how does sports medicine address the demands of specific athletes? We then look at what, what role do preventative actions play in enhancing the well-being of the athlete and how is injury rehabilitation managed? What I've also done is I will be um, going through today the first two. So just these two today. So we'll be going through that and looking at all the dot points with these. With these two, I'll be talking you through them. Just because um, these are more so... The, it's it, it's not the theoretical as such. Like with the first two you'll notice, especially here, there's a lot more um, theoretical knowledge that's evident. With these two, you know, it's knowing examples... And it's, it's a bit more, and it's some some of this is repeated in, like, factors affecting performance. For example, with preventative actions, we look at warm-up versus cool-down. So, you we've already talked about it. So, I'll talk you through the, um, I'll talk you through the dot points here. But I'm going to focus more so on the first two and, you know, really work through those two. Okay, so this is, um, firstly, how are, so this is the first thing we've got, um, how are sports injuries classified and managed so for this we want to focus on um the ways to classify sports injuries the different types of soft tissue injuries heart tissue injuries and assessment of injuries how do we assess them then what well, your job to is to firstly for example identify specific examples of injuries that reflect each of the classifications so you should be able to give me an example after we go through the content and i'll give you examples too um of what is a direct um what is a direct heart tissue injury or what is a soft indirect tissue injury um then with the soft tissue injuries you need to be able to tell me how we manage them i talk specifically about risa so you have already looked at risa in year 11 and so we'll you know um add on to that and also give me the immediate treatment of the different types of skin injuries which i'll go through too we're then looking at um the heart tissue injury so we are looking at fractures and dislocations so manage heart so you should be able to tell me how we manage heart tissue injuries, the assessment for medical attention, and also immobilization. So, um, why do we have to immobilize heart tissue injuries? Then we'll talk through the assessment of injuries. So, toe taps, talk, observe, touch, active, and passive movement and skill test. And you should be able to tell me um, what each one is and really talk me through each one. This could easily be like a five, six mark. I'll be able to explain each one and actually give me examples on how you would go about doing each step. And we're going to go through this today. So, let us have a look. Firstly, if you've got indirect and direct injury, 
uh, injury is classified as direct if there is an if there is an external force which is impacting on a person. So, for example, if we have two players colliding in a soccer tackle, um, and that causes an injury, and uh, and that causes an injury. A direct injury can also be caused by any external object. So, for example, if you are hit by a ball, um, that could be an external injury. So, that is a direct injury. So, it's coming from um, an external force. An indirect injury is when there is an internal force within the body. So, more, more than likely, usually it's a wrong technique that, um, or, or you know, poor technique or even equipment. So, that is when it is from within the body. So, an example could be you pull a hamstring while you're kicking a penalty um, in soccer from overextension and a lack of warm up. So, that's indirect um, because it's an internal force. So, soft and hard tissue injury. So, soft tissue injury has to do with the body tissues and it generally results in internal bleeding or bruising. So, soft tissue injuries um, can impact muscles, tendons, ligaments and skin and there are like specific classifications for each. So, muscles, if you have a soft tissue injury on muscles, um, you have what, what we call... Um, if you have a soft tissue injury on muscles, you have what we call strains. However, if you have a soft tissue injury on tendons, that is a strain. So injury, sorry, so injury to muscles is called strain. Injury to tendons, oh, sorry, um, injury, sorry, I, uh, yeah, so injury, uh, no, 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 okay, sorry, I confused myself there for a second, because I thought I may have done a typo, but no, um, both are strains. So muscle and tendon injuries are strains. However, lig injuries um, to the ligaments are called sprains. And then skin injuries um, can be classified as abrasions, lacerations, contusions, um, and blisters. So remember, the tendons connect muscles to bones. That's why issues to, uh, sorry, injuries to muscles or tendons are both strains. While ligaments connect bone to bone, um, they're called sprains. Um, a good way to remember that, just some came up with like very randomly is bone to bone is ligaments i just like to remember it, remember it as bbl um being like a cricket fan like it just sticks with me bbl is bone to bone um and that obviously refers to the big bash league like that's the reference here if you didn't get it if you're not a sports um if you're not a cricket person but that's one way i remember it but feel free to come up with any um you know acronym or a any acronym that works for you so we also have soft, um, so we've got heart tissue injuries, which, which are injuries to bone and teeth, and they can be either dislocations or fractures. Overuse injuries can also happen, and they occur as a result of, you know, repeated force um, being exerted on body parts, including bones, tendons, and muscles. And we'll talk a bit about this when we look at um, catering to the different types of athletes. But for now, you just need to know that this is when we are putting repeated stress on, like, bones, muscles, tendons, or a specific body part in general. And examples include shin splits, stress fractures, and tendonitis. They're always indirect injuries because it's, you know, internal force, you know, wrong technique, for example, in tennis, um, or it can also, or, or, you know, while you're running, like, or, or for example, yeah, like if you're running and every time you may be running, um, differently or you may be like putting more force on one foot than another which is, you know, it could be subconscious, that's in, that's an example of indirect injury. Okay, moving on. So next we've got um, classifying each one. So we've got tears. So tissue um, fibers of ligaments, tendons or muscles are torn. So let me get my pen up again. Oh, okay. So we've got tears. So Tissue fibers of ligaments, tendons, or muscle are torn. Remember, um, so either three, that's a T, and the cause can be a sharp movement or tight muscle. So that's, for example, and uh, for example, you know, if you've got like, um, if you pull, uh, if you pull hamstring, that is because you know it could be sharp movement, not enough warm up. Um, 
and that results in like tight muscle. Then sprains. Sprains refer specifically to injuries that are related to the ligaments um, when ligaments are forced beyond normal range. So the cause can be incorrect landing, uneven surface. Strains refer to uh, refer to injuries that are to the muscle or tendons where our tendons connect muscle to bone um, ligaments connect bone to bone and cause again can be incorrect landing uneven surface contusions are blood tissue and cells being damaged which causes internal bleeding so you want to know what each one is and um, generally contusions occur because due to collision with a person or object skin abrasion refers to minor minor open skin wounds so that can be a result of falling over scraping skin um, and the management now is cleaning with saline solution water and apply bandage finally we've got blisters so that could be due to frictional rubbing and pressure on the skin uh, on the skin Cause can be poorly fitted footwear or equipment. So generally, this one has a lot more to do with equipment, um, but also overtraining. And management is PS Express fluid covered with sterile non-adhesive. So you basically open the blister um, and apply padding and tape. So these are the different types, and you want to know the management for these. With these sprains, tears, and soft tissue injuries, those would require RISA. So don't forget RISA, rest, ice, compress, um, elevate and refer so those are so that's that um i'll quickly go through toe taps as well so toe taps refers to talk observe touch active movement passive movement and skills test so if someone's got like um for example um you know if, if they've got an injury especially a heart tissue injury what we do is we uh so if they've got an injury, um, we would firstly talk to them, ask them what happened, how it happened, what do they feel like, you know, um, and this is obviously if a person's conscious, if they're not conscious, you know, you're looking at like doctors A, B, C, D. Um, but yeah, so with this, we're looking, we're talking to them, how they're feeling, we're observing, for example, are they like flinching? Are they like, uh, are they looking pretty relaxed? And do they look like they're in obvious pain? Um, we would then touch now when it comes to touch you need to ask the person like you know you've um your ankle looks a bit swollen can i touch it can i feel it to see if it's like hot um and you know how swollen it is for example um so that's touch and in observe you will also look at for example if you've hurt like your right ankle um if the athlete has hurt their right ankle you will compare that to their left ankle and observe to see if there's any like apparent difference there um then we've got active and passive movement so active movement is when you know we would ask them to move for example you know to try and move their foot if they're able to do that that's good if they're not able to do that we would do passive movement and that's where you are asking them to uh you're asking them can i lift your foot up can i actually you know move your foot around and that is something you have to be very careful when you ask them um and they have to say yes and you know you would see for example, if it's their right ankle, you know, if you're moving it to the left, are they like really flinching or it's not hurting as much? What is the sort of, um, how much can they move, right? And finally, um, a skills test. Now, a skills test is if they're feeling pretty okay, they are still able to move, you know, like they've passed the active test and so when you get to the skills test, um, if it's a soccer player who's hurt their ankle, you know, the skill that you want them to test is being able to run you know you'll ask them okay go ahead run and if they're able to run if they can they're looking okay and it's not hurting them too much then they can continue on with the play but if they've already failed the active and passive movement um and they obviously then you know you wouldn't proceed to the skills test so this is um this way you know you can get questions like a player this has happened to a player what would you do those are the sort of the um you know simulated scenarios that you need to then apply this understanding to <laughs> Okay, wonderful. So that brings us to the end of how a sports injury is classified and managed. Now we're looking at a big second up point of how does sports medicine address the demands of specific athletes. So with this, we are going to focus um, on three types of athletes. So we learn about children and young athletes. We learn about adults and aged athletes and female athletes. So with each one you need so for each one for example for children you need to be able to analyze the implications of each of these considerations and how it's going to affect young young people participating and engaging in sports 
with adults and age athletes, you want to explain this, the sports participation options that they have, um, especially, you know, for aged people that have medical conditions, what, what can they participate in, you know, how should they participate? Then you've got female athletes to so assess the degree to which iron deficiency and bone density affect their participation in sports. So for each one, it's different, but, you know, it's about applying all of, um, all of what we talk about here. So we'll look through all three. And again, your job is to look at and apply that knowledge. So let's start with children and young athletes. So firstly, asthma. Um, I'm going to sort of give you the theory for it because it's important for you to, you know, if you get a question about um, if a young athlete has asthma, how should a coach manage it? Questions like that, you need to be able to actually give me information about what the condition is, what it involves, um, and how the coach is to manage that in the athlete so with asthma it is characterized uh, characterized by the inflammation of the air base when irritation occurs um, which means that there's limiting airflow and it is also triggered by pollen dust and even exercise so high intensity exercise can um, trigger it exercises that are done in longer duration are likely to trigger an attack um, and that is why an athlete needs to have you know asthma management plan so if you got um, you know, a question like describe how um, an athlete, uh, how a coach should manage an athlete with asthma. It's a three marker. You will give me what the condition is, right? You'll explain it. You will tell me that, you know, it needs to be managed by an asthma management plan. The athlete should have, um, the athlete should have like a, um, a puffer on them that they're able to use and the coach should know what to do. That will help you, you know, get two marks. And then I'll give you a third mark if you give me an example. Uh, which is basically uh, putting this in a scenario. So examples, again, are very, very important for PDHP. Then we've got diabetes. So there are two types of diabetes. Um, we've got type 1, which is a lifestyle-like disease. So it's a lifestyle, diet, and um, disease caused by a lack of physical activity generally. So it causes insulin to become inefficient. So insulin is used in the body to control and regulate the level of glucose. So glucose, um, your body, your body gets glucose after you eat a meal, right? And that, uh, and that glucose is in the bloodstream. And when those glucose levels go high, the body, um, after a meal, for example, you know, glucose levels are high, the body will activate the insulin system, uh, the, um, you know, certain, for example, the alpha, yeah, the, there's, there's a science behind it, you don't need to know that, but it's like um, a specific type of cells in your pancreas that are then going to start secreting insulin um, throughout your body, and that insulin is going to um, deal with the glucose, and what happens is glucose is um, stored in your kidneys as glycogen that is how it works and so if you've got um insulin that is inefficient that means that the that there's going to build up of glucose in your body and that is not good um type 1 diabetes on the other hand is an autoimmune response and that is because um the immune system doesn't recognize like the body's immune cells and so that is characterized by the body's inability to produce sufficient insulin in order to um, control and regulate the glucose levels in the body. Um, so in either of the case the coach obviously needs to know what is um, happening but general uh, what is happening like in you know, the firstly they need to um, make sure that uh, yeah, firstly, they would need to make sure that um, generally with something like this, um, you've got two types of episodes. You've either got a hypoglycemic episode or a hypoglycemic episode. So obviously, the coach needs to be mindful of this. Um, and with a hypoglycemic ep episode, what happens is that they have a sudden onset and cause of like, it has a sudden onset like it just happens um and it can include like the symptoms include uh, the signs include sorry rapid heart rate sweating shaking anxiety dizziness and unconsciousness and this is managed by providing them with sugary foods or drinks such as jelly beans and juice and further sh uh, and further food needs to be consumed um afterwards so this is when we see that their blood glucose levels have gone really low so that is why they need to consume um sugary drinks and food so the um 
coach for example needs to recognize those signs if you get a question like this you know a young athlete has diabetes you need and they don't sort of specify which one it is but it says a young athlete has diabetes how should a coach manage that you should be able to tell me um that you know the young athlete if uh, if they have either type 1 or type 2 diabetes both of which um you know affect the ability of the uh, ability of insulin to control and regulate glucose levels um and that can result in like hypoglycemiac and hyperglycemiac um episodes hyperglycemiac includes you know um these specific signs because the uh the um, blood glucose level has dropped down and that means that the coach should be aware of this and you know immediately um, feed the athlete with um, high energy foods like jelly beans or juice on the other hand <coughs> sorry on the other hand um, hyperglycemic episodes occur slowly and they may cause thirst vomiting weak rapid pulse um, rapid breathing <coughs> and drowsiness and medical assistance should be sought in treatment of hyperglycemic episodes so this is when your blood glucose level has spiked high so when that happens you know obviously you're not going to go feed them um high energy foods because the blood glucose is spiked high so this is where you'd need to take them immediately to like um to get medical assistance so that's diabetes and finally we've got epilepsy so sorry Okay, so epilepsy is a condition which is characterized by disturbances to the brain and that can cause episodes of unconsciousness and also um, if someone's got epilepsy, their physical the physical activity should be monitored um, and they should not like participate in specific sports like for example rock, rock climbing or diving um, and they should, sorry I've just, I've just sneezed, I feel like it's coming but it's not. <laughs> excuse me um but yeah so physical activity should be supervised like you know they should not do sports like rock climbing or diving with that like high altitude or like you know they're underwater the way you know it would be hard to actually tell what's happening like just um to um identify if they're having a she uh, they're having a seizure or not so that is very important and um also uh they should also exercise along with someone else so there should be someone supervising them so as a coach you know you should always be keeping an eye on them and making sure that they are participating safely in a safe sport and that is you know a parent's job really um okay now we've got adults and aged athletes so the three conditions that we want to talk about for adults and age athletes firstly is heart conditions now as one ages um this is a your susceptibility to heart conditions increases and this is generally uh, related to like hypertension a sedated uh, a sedentary lifestyle um and like general lifestyle behaviors and also um cardiovascular disease so um yeah and all of these are like really linked so you know if you've got higher blood pressure your susceptibility to um cardiovascular disease increases same thing with like high cholesterol levels um and that will you know uh increase susceptibility to heart conditions um aged athletes when they're participating in sports they should check with their gp first and get an all clear before starting and they need to stop at any signs of discomfort um and also work out with like family and friends and that is um that is generally suggested so that they you know if something does happen while they're working out they're not alone um there's someone to sort of support them and get the help that they need so the big thing for aged athletes is to get like a clearance of their gps first now looking at fractures and bone density so after the ages of 35 to 40 what happens is that your bone density becomes uh, begins to decline and your bone becomes more fragile so elderly people are more likely um, and more susceptible to weaker bones and thus uh, fractures if they fall down they're more likely to get a fracture um, and further osteoporosis is a common um, is also common with low bone density and it can result in um, you know low physical activity so so that is why strength training like resistance training for elderly people um can be important because generally you know because our bones grow um in like as a result to and in the direction of like pressure and weight so if you are not exercising if you've got this lack of physical activity you're not you know it can really um lead to more bone reabsorption than bone modeling and as a result then bone remodeling and as a result you get weaker bones because more calcium is being taken away from your bones so strength training can improve bone mineral um 
density and also bone strength. So finally, having a look at flexibility and joint mobility. So as an aged athlete um, becomes more sedentary, so as an aged athlete becomes more sedentary, their range of movement also is limited. You know, the thing with body is like if you don't use it, you lose it. So you need to use your body um, in order to ensure that it's still functioning and it's you know still healthy. So if you um, have a sedentary lifestyle, uh, you your range of movements is as a a athlete your range of movements become limited and decreased flexibility again can lead to more injury um of muscles and ligaments and also of course less mobility and there is more risk of you know like we said earlier falling um and injuries if an aged athlete does not continue to move heart condition loss of strength and lack of flexibility will arise so heart condition that they got if they have a sedentary lifestyle heart condition that's susceptible to that um loss of strength because of bone um bone, like uh, decreasing bone density and osteoporosis and also lack of flexibility Okay, now let's have a look at female athletes. So when we are looking at female athletes, we want to consider the sort of the triad. And um, within the triad, we're looking at three main um, elements that affect, um, you know, female athletes and underpin the aspects that we need to sort of, you know, be uh, very mindful about when it comes to their safe participation in sports. So there's eating disorders, menstruation and weak bones. Those are the main three things. So let's have a look at how that directly affects sports um, and the performance in sports. So we've got bone density which um, firstly is largely affected by low levels of estrogen in menstruation in menstruation irregularities um, diet like low calcium which means that their strength and muscle which will affect their strength and muscle and also their nerve function uh, menopause they lose so women lose calcium faster than men therefore that can lead to brittle bones and thus need to ensure safety when they're exercising and the reason that that this happens um, as a result of menopause is because of estrogen plays a huge role in bone remodeling there's a huge role in, in bone remodeling when um, women go through menopause their estrogen levels like drop really rapidly so there's a rapid decline in the level of estrogen levels which means there's a rapid decline in bone remodeling and there's more and there's more bone resorption that's happening so more so more bone reabsorption versus remodeling means that they are losing the bone faster than you know calcium is being taken away from the bone faster so it's breaking down faster but it's not being rebuilt like it's not being rebuilt and so as a result of that they're more susceptible to brittle bones um and there's another factor that can affect um bone density is um amenorrhea so that is when they have low east uh, that is absence of periods which again means that they have low estrogen levels and that again affects um bone remodeling finally estrogen like we said plays a huge role in bone in strong bones so after you know so when women hit menopause um the estrogen levels drop significantly and that means that their bone reabsorption is happening faster than bone remodeling so their bone uh, strength declines rapidly as well iron deficiency um is firstly iron itself has a huge role to play in the transportation of oxygen so it helps hemoglobin bind to oxygen for transport uh, for transport and low iron means fatigue lethargy and weakness um, and women are more prone to iron deficiency because they lose blood um, and iron through menstruation so that's why they have to consume extra um generally take like iron supplements Iron deficiency can also be um, can also come about due to insufficient consumption in diets, especially if you're vegetarian, vegan, or eating um, or or they have eating disorders that can lead to high rates of iron deficiency. So eating disorders, um, women are females are more susceptible to eating disorders, especially um, you know like due to the sports that they participate in. For example, gymnastics like it's a huge focus on. Um, 
on body on on the appearance of the body um and that can have a huge impact on um obviously an athlete's a female athlete's psychology and bulimia and anorexia nervosa are the disorders that can result um as a result of this pressure so if an eating disorder manifests itself into extreme weight loss females can lose their menstruation cycle but this is why it's harmful because um if they um yeah if they if they've got extreme weight loss that can affect their menstruation cycle which will in turn affect their um their estrogen levels which will affect their bone density right so that means that they have um poor skeletal health and again more risk um of injuries as a result of like bone fractures pregnancy so they're more susceptible to injury um during pregnancy because of a hormone called relaxin which loosens joints um and increases joint mobility making it easier to become injured increase in weight can also be a risk of injury due to increased impact and exercise is most definitely recommended um to reduce the risk of gestational diabetes help mood and help maintain the before before weight um and allows them to get back sooner into performance after pre- after pregnancy. So that's done. Um, all right, so we've talked through these two points, and I'm just going to talk through the what the main ideas are for the next two. So what role do preventative actions play in enhancing the well-being of the athlete? Like I said earlier, with the first two top points, it was more theory-related, like you had to know, for example, the different diseases, what was happening more biologically. With these two, it's more about like sports rules and stuff. So with physical prep, like pre uh, so basically preventative actions, um, we want that athlete to be physically prepared. So pre-screening, you know, getting a medical clearance of their doctor which we've talked about in adults and age athletes um their skill and technique needs to be on point physical fitness needs to be up and they should be warming up stretching and cooling down they should be warming up so that they have increased um muscle flexibility and cooling down so that they can disperse like lactic acid and stuff and not have you know doms like delayed onset muscle soreness uh sports policy and sports environment so you'll talk about you know the rules of sports and activities how there are rules to keep the players and the spectators safe um there are modified rules for children like kanga cricket and like um examples of those where you know you're reducing the time you're giving everyone a fair play um for example in kanga cricket every child gets two overs um and also a chance to bat and that way you know a child is more all around it and so they won't get like overuse injuries if you've got like one kid who's the star bowler bowling all the time um matching of opponents so this is something that you'll discuss in terms of you know um in like like all uh events should be organized in a way so that opponents are evenly matched up if you've got like um physical differences that like huge physical differences we can see how one um player may be more um yeah like may uh may benefit more in comparison to the other player uh we also look at the use of protective protective equipment so you know there are more chances of injuries if you're not you if the equipment is not fitted if it's not perfect um so you can get uh so yeah so you can you know so that can increase your chance of injury hence you need protective equipment safe grounds and facilities are also important to keep spectators and um and also the players safe so for example you know having um like making sure there's no rubbish on the fields so that uh, spectators are kept at a distance like there are proper arrangements there um environmental considerations you'll talk about like temperature regulation um climatic conditions how a player would adapt to different types of conditions like in temperature in like high temperatures how would we um you know for example how would a player adapt to that um wind rain altitude guidelines for fluid intake so that is very similar to what we looked at in sport uh in um factors affecting performance when we talked about hydration guidelines for fluid intake and a climate acclimatization finally taping and bandaging so this is where we're looking at the what the role of preventative taping is um and taping for isolation of injury and also bandaging for immediate treatment of injury then how is injury rehabilitation managed 
So for this, you'll look at the rehabilitation procedures, so progressive mobilization, graduated exercise like stretching, conditioning, total body fitness, um, training, and also the use of heat and cold. So the use of heat and cold is very similar to chirotherapy that we looked at factors um, that we looked at in factors affecting performance. Similarly, um, the last bit about returning to play is all about you know making sure an athlete after they have um, if they've been injured they can return like they um, you know when they return to play they are pain free there's a degree of mobility we monitor we monitor their uh, their progress so pre test versus the post test to see um, if they have recovered uh, we also look at psychological readiness if they're psychologically ready to come back some players may be too ready so they may be ready to come before they're physically healed um, we look at specific warm-up procedures so very similar to factors affecting performance and also ethical considerations so here you look specifically at the use of painkillers and how a lot of athletes had been um yeah had been consuming uh consuming painkillers to come back earlier um, but that in the long term injured them and affected their overall well-being okay so that's that done there again if you have any questions please put them through um i know i would have loved to go through you know the last in more detail but obviously time constrained um time yeah obviously we're constrained by time and i felt like the first two had more theoretical knowledge that you needed to keep in mind in comparison to the last two that's why i chose to go through those two okay now look, let's have a look at what the essential ingredients for um success are in hsc pdhp so, really important, firstly, understanding the question. You need to know the syllabus terms and the surrounding dot point. Like I said, you know, it can be asked about, for example, um, rehabilitation procedures. How can an athlete rehabilitate? What should they do? So, you need to know the four dot points underneath. You need to be able to talk about progressive mobilization, graduated exercise training, use of heat and cold, all four to get your full marks because that is what... Um, you know makes up that dot point so understanding the question you want to try and have a checklist and going over the response and checking does it answer the question um recall so answering the question with the right information and finally peel or burgers so this is where you want to have a good structure to help guide your writing so mind maps are a good source um, when it comes to organizing your notes like it can be really helpful especially with pdhp like you can make like uh, mind maps about like for example the big question you know how can for example how is injury rehabilitation managed then so in that big dot point i'm answering i'm looking at two main things rehabilitation procedures and return to place so those are my two main dot points and then under each one i can write the points or for example if you've got like the energy systems you can break it down aerobic energy system was this as an anaerobic was this aerobic what is happening in each one um so different ways of construction might not you can do it on paper there are online tools to do it um there's a really good tool called I've just forgotten the name um mm, i've forgotten the name if i remember i'll put it in the chat um but yeah there's a really good tool uh, for my maps online you can use things like miro which is another good tool to use um now to get a band six in PDHPE, there are a couple of things that we need to work on. The band six requirements in general are, we need to obviously have knowledge and understanding of concepts. Um, applying theoretical principles is important. You know, we learn about all these theories, like this is what a person should do. Say so there's a soft tissue, in, soft tissue injury, this is how you know, it should be dealt with. But applying that to a certain scenario is what is going to get you the marks. That is how the question is going to be, um, generally given to you they want you to apply that knowledge uh demonstrates a superior understanding of the interrelated roles and responsibilities of individuals groups and governments in the management of promotion of health that's core one critically analyze movement and range of factors that affect physical performance and then provide relevant and accurate examples to justify complex, complex arguments about health participation and performance okay so let's have a look um here is an example here's the response discuss how a weightlifter might use goal setting to enhance their motivation to five marker let's break it down together and let's see what we can improve so a weightlifter will use goal setting in order to enhance their motivation to and uh, their motivation towards their support goal setting is a strategy used to enhance motivation and improve where the athlete will work um will set their goals to will set their goals to provide focus determination success and of course motivation goal setting may be split into short-term goals or long-term goals 
Short-term goals are essentially the stepping stones for long-term. For example, short-term goals is completing a week-long training session, whereas long-term goal is trying to compete in the Olympics. So um, I'm just going to go through it, but basically it's a decent response, right? But I would change certain things. Um, there, There's a lot of repetition happening over here. Like, I feel like there's a lot of repetition happening here. They're repeating um, similar things over and over again. It sort of messes with the structure of the writing. So what I might do is, um, you know, like this can actually be um like re repeating and like waffling can sometimes show the marker that you actually don't know what you're talking about that you're just repeating the same thing to get the marks um also when you are giving an example you want to be very specific so for example um sorry ignore my line there um so just that line over there. So to increase weight preps and stuff. So this line here, um, very vague. If you want to give examples, be specific. So what I might do is, I might, so the way I might structure my response is to still have an intro, right? Same as yours. Um, define the SMART goals. So SMART goals are basically specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. This is something you would go through. Um, and you want to apply SMART goals to um to you know goal setting and then give examples of long-term goals following smart and also short-term goals following smart so try to have one performance and one behavior oriented goal example so explain why these goals are useful for then enhancing motivation and finish off with a concluding sentence so my response may look something like this goal setting is used to improve motivation and reduce anxiety goals can either be long-term or short-term short-term goals are used as stepping stones to measure progress and maintain motivation towards long-term goals in order for goals to be effective, they must be constructed within the SMART criteria. And then by constructing the goals by SMART criteria, athletes ensure they have realistic target and with short-term goals, ensure that they stay on track achieving it. A weightlifter's goal may be to squat 200 kg in a year. So with that previous response, you saw that they were very vague, that it wasn't linked back to a weightlifter. Whereas with this response, I'm linking specifically back to you know what the goal of a weightlifter could be. Um, the short-term goals may include small increments of 5 kg per month. Goals can then be behavior oriented. Example, a goal may be to go to gym five times a week. Smaller goals are easier to achieve and continue to sustain motivation in the athlete. Establishing goals using SMART criteria is essential for the athlete. For example, if the goal was simply to become strong at squatting, there would be no benchmark to define when the goal was met, um, how long the athlete um, had to accomplish it, causing them to lose motivation and track of progress. In conclusion, so there's my conclusion, I'm summing everything up, goal setting is vital for maintaining motivation and improving performance. However, the goals must follow the SMART criteria in order for, in order for them to be helpful. Furthermore, both short and long-term goals must be established in order um, for motivation to be long-lasting. And that's my succinct conclusion at the end, tying everything together. Okay, um, please feel free to uh, ask any questions, you know, any comments on this response. But um, we are... We have smashed it for the day. So thank you so much um, for tuning in today. I wish you guys all the very best. Please feel free to send through any questions. Um, I, I hope you found today's lecture helpful. And I am sure you all smash BDHPE. Good luck um, and enjoy the rest of your holidays. I'll see you guys later. Ah. Um.